morning to you. It's Saturday the 28th of March 2015. My name's Chris Reardon and welcome to this morning's United Kingdom Talk. How are you on this fun-packed, very, very windy Saturday uh, morning afternoon outside? I noticed, I did wonder if we were about to have our first tornado in Bracknell. I don't like the look of these tornadoes. Marge in Oklahoma, uh, only on Wednesday when we are doing a live show on Wednesday, uh, mentioned the fact that there were seven Several, several tornadoes heading directly towards her home. Yes, it was very frightening. She did say that she might have to disappear suddenly if a tornado uh, bears down upon her home. But fortunately, I do believe it veered off at the last moment. And Marge has been sending me in various videos of uh, tornadoes this week. Marge in Oklahoma, thank you very much. for. I'm so glad we don't have such things here, dear. Well, we do, but they're very, very, very rare. I think they have quite a few out in the sort of um, Atlantic Ocean, which uh, is around us. But uh, I, very rarely do we have them actually land, come down in the land. Although I do remember a couple of years ago, they had one in West London and it ripped a few um, roofs off houses and that sort of thing. It's very narrow, isn't it? The tornado, it's the, the, um, the damage bit is very narrow as it kind of decides what path it's going to turn. You know, and depending on how you think it happens, do you think there is someone controlling these tornadoes? And if you're a bad person, they will come towards you, dear. That's the question. Thank you, Marge. Uh, Marge also says, I want to tell Brandon he re she really enjoyed the fact that he braved calling on, in on the show last uh, Wednesday. And I think it's the first time that Brandon had ever called it in on a... Oh, it's not really a t it's not really a TV show, is it? It's, it's like a, a... What do you call it? A streaming show? What do, you, what do you call this? A live podcast? I don't even know what you'd call this. Very, very strange indeed. Uh, Marge also sends a little email in saying, Elderly love telling stories from the past. So about leaflets. How about you leave some leaflets... Uh, advertising your show at senior citizens' places. I, I don't think I don't think leaflets is the way to go, really, Marge. Not in this day and age. I don't think people read leaflets. I certainly, as soon as they come through the door, they go straight in the bin, in the recycling bin here. I don't bother reading any of those pizza leaflets or send a kebab through the post or anything like that. We don't do anything like that, no. Um, she says, uh, another... Th uh, only a lot are computer illiterate, so use a computer. Yeah, I don't think people read leaflets anymore, Marge. And besides, if they're not computer literate, how are they going to watch the show? Think about that one, you see? You see? Another thing is topics people love to debate a lot. If you ever had a debate talk show, I bet it would be packed. Of course, you don't make those type of videos. I don't mean like politics. Well, we talk about anything really, Marge. Uh, bear in mind, I, I've, I've never considered myself particular. Oh, I've just seen a lovely picture of Barry Manilow from Eloise's page there. He's wearing a white shirt and he's kind of tilting. His, you can see his earpiece in where they... That's not a hearing aid, by the way. You know when they see the, you see these musicians and they have these things? Some people think they're hearing aids. No, they're not. What they can hear is the music and everything directly into their ear, rather than bounced around all the walls in whatever in whatever venue they were uh, 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 performing in. They have to do it like that. March says, the storm came after I logged off Wednesday's live show, but it was just a lot of wind and hail. Oh, I mean, I suffer for that myself, Marge. Wind, dear? It's terrible sometimes. I have to lock myself away. I've also, you know, you only have that trouble when you might pass wind under bed covers or something. Why hasn't anyone invented yet? Sort of some sort of extractor fan <laughs> that you can fit to your bed to whisk away all those nasty smells that leak out while you're asleep. Need some sort of extraction unit on the beds itself, I think. Yes, especially if you're in there with someone. Oh, I can't bear it when they do that. Mind you, it's been a few years, unfortunately. Um, she says, it was just a lot of wind and hail uh, where I live, but east of Oklahoma City in a town called Moore, they were hit by tornadoes. 
don't like tornadoes. My brother buys lottery tickets and they give away a chance per ticket to win a storm shelter. They don't, do they really? Win a storm <laughs> Why is that funny? That's a very serious <laughs> win a storm shelter. <coughs> I made an envelope to send them in, which I had about six to send in, mailed it, and then realised I forgot to put the tickets in the envelope. You're losing your mind, dear. So missed the chance this month to win. Talk about Dove. How, uh, can you make a storm? Do you have to dig a big hole or what? Does it go in the ground? How much is a storm shelter, Marge? I'm, I'm quite interested to know that. Perhaps I should have one built here, you know. And I could put my studio down there in the storm shelter, couldn't I? Just, just, a, just an idea, really. Hmm. Because you never know. We need to keep the show on air as long as possible. While I'm doing the show, I lock all the doors and windows in here, you know, dear. We don't want it. religious extremists coming in and taking over the show. It could happen. Very, very important, this programme, to many, many people in all parts of the world. I have storm stories I can share later on, and uh, one I almost died in. Oh, dear. Anyway, this is Marge signing off. Thank you, Marge in uh, Oklahoma. And I'm very glad, Marge, you weren't blown away, dear. I'm pleased to note that you weren't blown away in that storm, all right? Um, hello to Shania uh, this morning, who unfortunately uh, did not wake up in time for our late-night Wednesday show last week. And I have suggested she got a tease made. She sent me a little message. Oh, she does not know what a tease made is. So I'm wondering if anyone else does not know what a tease made is. Do you know what a tease made is? Any idea? No? Nothing in there? Hello? Is the light on? Is there anyone home? No? A tease made is this little device that sits by your bed. And it's got a clock on the front. Goblin and Swan are two manufacturers that make them. Actually, Swan might have taken over Goblin. I can't remember now. Uh, but anyway, uh, the tea's made... Um, oh, sorry, I just banged my hand on there. Uh, the tea's made... You put water in it and milk. I think in one... Do you put milk in it? No, you don't put milk in there. But you put... A, there's like a teapot or maybe a cup. And you put tea leaves or tea bag in there and you set the clock and it makes the tea just before the alarm goes off. How fabulous is that? I had one for years and I never used it. But wonderful little gadgets. And I think I think we're going to have to buy We might all have to club together and buy Shania on the Isle of Wight a little tea's made so that in future she can wake up to our uh, late night shows. What do you reckon, Shania? Would you like one of those? You'll probably get a cheap one. Hang on, look, do they do them on eBay? I bet they do them on eBay. Just a moment, please. I shall search for you. Searching now. One moment, please. eBay, where are we? A tea's made. Tea's made. I don't suppose you need a new one. The new ones are about 80 quid. Oh, look, here's one. It's £36. Goblin teas. Here's one. Here you are. Vintage. It's here. Look at this. I'm going, to, I'm going to post this on my Twitter. One moment, please. OK. Now, my Twitter is Chris Reardon UK. All right. Chris Reardon UK is my Twitter. So follow me on Twitter and we can put the little bits and pieces on there as well. So there is a link to a vintage 1970 Goblins tea's made. And, just a minute, are you ready for this? It's only £14.99. pence. Yes. And this is the actual tea's made that I remember. Oh, it's lovely. Do you know, I'm tempted to buy that myself. If I, now that I've mentioned this, you lot probably bid on that so that I can't get it. Oh, I love the look of that. A little tea. Do you know what? I'm so tempted to buy that now. Let's see what it says. It features a complete oh, iconic item from the 1970s. A great British innovation. Oh, you've got to have one of these in your ass. Yes, it features a complete automatic tea-making system along with an alarm clock. The single master rotary switch controls everything. Off, light, automatic, alarm set by thumb wheel at front. It's, I mean, it's really old-fashioned looking. Makes four cups of tea and leaves enough hot water in a kettle for another couple of cuppers. Oh, 
Oh, oh no, cash on collection only. Oh, it's too far. It's too far. We can't, I can't be going to collect something. I'd love that one. Let's see if there's another one similar. Oh, there's a swan one. 12 pounds. Oh, collection only again. And there's another goblin one. That one's 95 quid. Oh, we're not paying that, dear. Uh, free, uh, there's, now what's that one? Is that a goblin? Eight for, pink goblin. Oh, that's nice. Anyway, have a look at, oh, there's a 10, collection only. I can't be doing collection only, dear. Collection. Anyway, have a look through there, okay? What you're looking for is Tease Made. T E A S M A I D. Tease Made. And there's loads of them on eBay. Loads of them. Oh, you yeah, it's really like. Oh, it's one here for five pounds. It's one there for five pounds. Oh, you've got to get one. You've got to get one. It really is like. Taking a taking a step back to the 1970s on that. We like the 70s. Morning, Rory, who says, Chris, I know what Tease Made is. Great chatting, Wednesday. It was lovely to talk to you on the phone. Have you got a Tease Made, Rory? I think you should get one. Then you could wake up for the Wednesday night late time show on that one. I'm checking Twitter. My step gran had a Tease Made as well. Yeah, the Twitter is Chris Reardon UK, Rory, OK? Chris Reardon UK uh, on the uh, Twitter there. Uh... Marge says, can't watch live this morning, no internet except for my cell phone, and it will eat up all my bandwidth, so I'll watch later. Yes, it's a little bit quiet this morning, I must say. <laughs> very, very quiet indeed this morning. Uh, good morning to voiceover artists, Anonymous, Wayne, he's got several names. Good morning, sir. Uh, you, you may call in whenever you're ready, actually. Call in whenever you're ready, OK? Uh, I just, uh, you may notice my lip is, looks sore. But what it is, is a little lump came up on that, like a spot. That was on Wednesday morning, I think it came up. And it doesn't actually feel anything. There's no tingling or pain or pressure in there at all. All right, so I don't think it's anything bad. Um, it's starting to go down now. Stranger, isn't it? That, honestly, it's, it's almost as if it's not actually there. Although, yesterday, I don't know if this is connected at all. Yesterday, I bit my tongue twice. <gasps> oh, don't you hate that? Mm, bit, my mm, bit my tongue twice. Not very pleasant at all. So uh, that's that. Uh, uh, my nephew today is for his 18th birthday, which is on Monday. Is it Monday? One minute. No, Wednesday. My nephew's birthday. Is it Wednesday? Yes. My nephew's birthday is Wednesday. He is 18 years old. Jimmy Butler. On April the 1st, he is an April Fool, 18 on Wednesday. Unbelievable. And today, he's being taken out as a surprise. Now, I'm about to tell you what it is. I know he's in the car with his brother. So, just in case you are watching and listening to this, Jimmy, please... Turn your phone off for the next 10 seconds now, and I shall tell everyone what it is. Don't look. Don't look. Ready? He's been taken to a surprise It's a Knockout theme type thing today, where him and loads of his friends and family are all going to be there, but he doesn't know. He doesn't know they're all going to be there. And it's like, like outdoor activities and things. So that's what he's going to do today. So I hopefully we'll hear about that a little bit later on. So that's what he's doing. Happy birthday. And that's in uh, Nottingham, I think, which is uh, kind of up up north-ish. OK, up north-ish. Now, Anonymous, are you there or not? I'm not quite sure you're if you're there or not, Mr. Voiceover Artist. Give us a call in on the uh, Skype. You can Skype in if you want to, boys and girls. Uh, my Skype in is United Kingdom Talk, all one word. United Kingdom Talk. There's a phone in number as well. 020-8144-3477. 020-8144-3477. I've got a little night off tonight. I thought I deserved a night off, so I'm, so I'm off tonight. Uh, hello to Anne. Who says, on the subject of getting leaflets and cards doing to advertise our little programme, if you get leaflets and cards done, Chris, I'm sure it will help your mighty big talent. Oh, please do me a favour, Anne. Listen, just, just because you like me doesn't mean that I've got a mighty big talent, Anne, I have to tell you. Um, 
some of these uh, 100 uh, uh, of TV <clears throat> chat. Shut up a minute, Anonymous. I'll be with you in a minute. <laughs> Were you burping then? I'm the friendly stranger in the black sedan. I want you to hop inside my car. You're the what? <clears throat> it's a rock and roll song, you twerp. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Let me finish this email. Hang on a minute. Um, she says, uh, some of these hundreds of TV channels should be signing you up. I don't know. Are you sure, Anne? I don't think I want to be on anything that remotely resembles Towie. Uh, Blackman's got talents. I'm not sure. Oh, uh, I'm not reading anymore. That is just uh, self-promoting. Hang on a minute. Uh, oh, on the subject of your of your bike, because um, anonymous, I've a uh, uh, voiceover artist, Wayne. What shall I call you today? You can call me anything you want, as long as it's not late for dinner. Late for dinner, then. No, Mr. Late for Dinner. Have you noticed um, things don't work... Uh, uh, last as long for example um, and I've, I've mentioned this a few years ago you may remember my bike chain and the cog on the back have both worn out do you ever remember having that happen as a child to your bike no because they were made of real steel not this Asian crap they're importing on the backs of people that sneak in at night I don't yes Absolutely. You don't get any more than four or five, three, four, three or four years out of one of those cogs on the back now. I never, ever re remember replacing anything other than brake pads on my bike as a child. Everything lasts for the lifetime of the bike. Now you don't get three or four years out of it. It's, it's absolute crap, the metal they use. Now, I took my bike in because uh, it needed this done to it. And they wanted to charge me a hundred and seventy pounds. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So about three hundred dollars for this work, right? A new bike, a new bike, is about hundred and eighty dollars. So what's the point? There's no point. The thing I worry about is hitting a series of bumps in the road, and the frame breaks, and you end up with a metal tube going up your bung. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> And you remember, of course, um, the uh, mud guards on the front and back. Now, these used to come as standard, made of metal and absolutely solid as a rock. Now, you have to buy these bits as extras. And they're these flimsy plastic things that shake all over the place as you cycle along. What's even worse is, here in the States... It's gotten to the point where most of, if not all, of the bicycles floating around don't even come with any sorts of fenders whatsoever. None. Can you imagine riding something like that and going through a mud puddle? No, Especially if you were headed to work. I mean, you walk in the door of the place where you're working, your whole backside's covered with schmutz, you know. That is exactly how they are here. If you want fenders, most of the time, uh, we call them fenders or... Um, or, or uh, mud guards. If you want those, you have to buy them as extra. And they're these plastic things, and they're only held on at the very top with one screw. So badly made. And chances are that one screw is going to be loose, you know. It's, it, it, it does become loose, and then the whole thing drops down and then starts rubbing on the tyre. With those old ones, you know, it will be held on both sides, on either side of the wheel, and again, both sides at the top, wasn't it? I remember. How are you, sir? Well, my son came home for his so-called Easter break from university. Whereabouts are you again, Wayne? He, he, he and I'm in upstate New York. I'm I'm right on the New York Pennsylvania border. I can I can leave my house and go drive for a very short drive and cross over into Pennsylvania and enter the land where they're doing that uh, funny drilling they call fracking. Oh, what do you think of that? Uh, I asked my son about it because he's studying all things geological and right. planetary sciences and all this stuff. Because here on our side of the border, the politicians started this big scare campaign where we'd all start growing third eyes and our left nut would be hanging down at my, your knee. You know, stuff like that. If they yeah. don't let these people drill, otherwise you're going to hell in a handbag. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Meanwhile, on the Pennsylvania side of the border, they pay like half as much for gasoline as we do here in New York. The property taxes are half as much, uh, and everybody's got a job. On our side of the border, it's like if you want to work, 
oh, well, we'll pay you a dollar an hour, and uh, but you gotta, you know, clean the bathrooms and make sure you sweep the parking lot before you right. leave at night. So, uh, yeah, and and all of the industries are gone. I, International Business Machines, which used to call this area home, there, there's the, all these huge buildings sitting across the river from me with massive parking lots. And the weeds are starting to grow up out of the parking lots. And the buildings, you don't even want to drive by them at night because it's like a scene from a bad horror film. You, know, you, right. you can hear the ghosts of employees pass. Like, you know, <laughs> is, there a lot of a, is there a lot of, like, empty, like, streets full of empty offices and homes and things like that? The main shopping district that used to be bustling and alive with all sorts of, you know, cafes and and department yes. stores and, and things like that uh, is now very questionable. Um, the, the only place over there that's, that's thriving, well, there's two places that are thriving. One of them is, is a uh, bar, nightclub kind of a place, and the other one is what used to be a movie theater. Fortunately, they turned it into a performing arts center where young people could go and, and work in plays and study performing and stuff like that. But when it gets close to sundown, most of the people who are, are not up to hand-to-hand -hand combat, you know, quickly jump into their automobiles, provided the wheels and tires are still on them, and <laughs> run back home. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, that, I, I, one, I, one chain topic, and then we have to get off into the more important stuff. Uh, only once did I have a, a problem with a chain that put me in peril of my own life. I was leaving a, a TV station where I was working at their transmitter site. And to leave the transmitter building, I had to drive on this dirt driveway. And it was uh, more than a quarter of a mile before you got to the edge of the hill where you, yeah. you know, started down into the valley. So here I am putting along in my Triumph Bonneville and all of a sudden, the chain comes off and I'm like, oh crap. Meanwhile, overhead of me at the top of the TV tower, lightning's dancing around and it's running down the, the guy wires on the, we call them towers, you call them masts. Yes. And spraying all over the place. So here I am underneath all of this, looking for the missing safety link for my chain so I could put the damn thing back together again. I found the safety link, pushed the bike back over to the transmitter building. There was a garage door so I could take it inside and got things put back together and waited for the storm to subside a little. And then I went back outside and fired up my motorcycle and, and left. But uh, I immediately went to the Triumph dealer's place and mm. had him replace the chain with a new one because this wasn't going to happen again. <laughs> no, I think actually, yeah, I think once I had a tri chain um, uh, come off and it had stretched and it needed a new train, but... None of this, none of this business with replacing cogs on the back, and you know I don't know what it's called, but the cog where the wheel, where the pedals are as well, is saying that needs to be replaced as well. And sure enough, you know he gets you a new one out, and he says, "Look, there's the difference. The one on my bike is now like a sharp point, whereas the, uh, the cogs, whereas the one, the new one, is like it goes up and it goes, it's like flat." And goes along so you can see it's worn out but the point is they never used to wear out and you're absolutely right they're making it with crap metal yep they do the same thing with uh we have hot water heaters in this country you folks uh, your hot water heating systems are are tankless the water gets heated when you're using it they don't store it in massive quantities uh, like no, we do here some of us some of us do still have tanks i've, I've actually got a tank but the reason I've still got a tank is because I've got solar panel on the roof and that heats the water and it needs to store it somewhere. Some of us have tanks, some of us don't. Well, anyhow, it's, it's, it's not unusual for the, whatever the warranty period is on the, the hot water boiler tank thing that you buy here in the States. They've got it down to such a fine science that if you're willing to pay the extra money and get one with a 10-year warranty, okay, mark the date on a calendar and keep track of it as the years go by. Yeah. You know, like three yeah, and a half yeah, to yeah. Ten, ten days after the ten years is up, boop, there, there's water on the floor. You know? It goes. <coughs> you got a bit of a cough there, haven't you? Oh, that's courtesy of my son that came back from university. He gave me his head cold. Oh, I did everything no. I could to hold it at bay, 
What you, no, what you uh, want to do, you want to go on a lovely, lovely holiday. Now, I can recommend a place, actually, in Australia. It's not actually on the mainland called Norfolk Island. Have you heard of that? Well, that just happens to be something we need to talk about today because poor Norfolk Island. See, here in the States, N-O-R-F-O-L-K is a place in Virginia that's a famous large naval base. And uh, you would think that it would be pronounced Norfolk, but uh, through the decades, especially since World War II, um, the sailors down there referred to it as N-O-F-O-L-K. And no, I'm not going to say it. You can if you want to. It's your show. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, that, but I, I, I vaguely remember you going there one time. I, I think it was on a... A uh, hot air balloon or something. Either, no, either that or there was a problem. I went, I went twice. I went twice there. Um, Do you still have a relative working there? Or? I did, yes. Uh, he was stationed over there. He was running the police over there. Uh, first for two years, but then he was extended by another year. So he ended up doing three years there. And it's a, a tiny little island in the Pacific Ocean. Um, politically corrected, connected to Australia. But I've had some very, very bad times there. There. Um, it, it was expensive to go there, expensive to stay there, and their only income really was tourism. Yeah. Um, they had their own sort of elected government there, and basically they run out of money, and uh, main Australian government, Kent and Canberra, helped them out a few times. Um, but the trouble is no one on the island, I don't think, paid any tax. Well, I found uh, a story got... on the uh, BBC's World Service website that uh, details some of the history of the island and oh, yeah. Go on, the, the people that live it. there. So, mm -hmm. If the BBC wants to sue, they can contact my solicitors in London. It's Turnham, no, Burnham, once, Spurnham, once, and Geldham. Don't have to do that. Once you've, once you've <laughs> credited where the story comes from, like you, you often hear me say, say, right, this is from the Daily Express or this is from the Daily Mail, or this is from the BBC. Once you've credited that organisation, it's OK to speak about it. Hmm. Does that apply to gossip too? <laughs> you gossip as much as me as possible. <laughs> OK, well, here we go, folks. I don't know if my voice is going to hold up without having a coughing fit, but we'll give it a try. Um, here's what the BBC has to say about the whole thing, and I'll, I'll try to read it verbatim uh, without too many wise-ass comments so cross your fingers uh it says and i quote last thursday norfolk islanders commemorated the anniversary of the sinking of the hms sirius the flagship of britain's first fleet that made the six-month journey from england in 1788 to establish the first excuse me white settlement <clears throat> in australia it sailed in 1790 from sydney to the island's small settlement laden with vital supplies. As luck would have it, the ship was wrecked offshore on a reef in Slaughter Bay. How appropriate is that? For a settlement never far from starvation, it was an unnerving moment. So now, 225 years later, Norfolk Islanders are lamenting what they claim is another disaster, the wrecking of their democracy and their independence. On Thursday, this Thursday that just went past, they learned that the Australian government planned to present legislation to the nation's parliament that would dismantle Norfolk Island's Legislative Assembly and force the islanders to pay income and company tax to Australia. Yeah, we'll teach you. Uh, the changes, wait a minute, i got to mark that. That's one comment I shouldn't have made. The changes would give the 1,800 islanders access to Australian health and welfare payments for the first time, while the New South Wales government would provide essential services on behalf of the Commonwealth of Australia. But the loss of self-government seems too high a price for the islanders, many of whom are descendants of Tahitians and the HMS Mountie mutineers, who resettled there from the Pitcairn Islands in 1856 and fiercely maintained their independence ever since. The island's chief minister, Lyle Snell, rejects the Australian government's claim that residents support the changes. He plans to hold a referendum on self-government within the next two months. And we quote, 
We were deeply disappointed with the way the news was delivered. What the hell were they expecting, a carrier pigeon? Uh, the big issue is the obliteration of our legislative assembly and self-government. No longer will the residents of Norfolk Island be able to have a voice on issues that affect them, such as health, social welfare, policing, education, and what days of the week they can play baseball. Mr. Snell has been worried for some time about the governing coalition's election promise to make changes to the island. Last October, he visited Canberra with a petition signed by more than 740 islanders advocating that island residents have a say in how their 35 square kilometer home is governed. He said at the time the model is the federal government wanted to impose would prove dysfunctional and inoperable. Since then, he claims the risk of the abolition of self-government would also do away with the island's virtual tax-free status, and it's scaring away business investment. The island's main source but, of revenue is... There, there is, that's the trouble. There is no business. I don't think there is any business investment there. That's the problem. They haven't got anything. Well, you know, they could always do what the Asians did and bring in the sex trade. I don't know. Oh, no. Uh, that, do you know, I, that was actually, I think, the, what, what was it? There were, there were two things that were discussed while I was there, actually. One was opening up to gay and lesbian weddings, which I found a bit odd. You know, what, why would you want to go there? And the other one was to build a big casino there. And they didn't want that either. And I think both of those things, um, I, 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 you know, I, I thought, well, what strange ideas they've come up with, really. You know, you don't want a casino there. Certainly not. This is a quiet, peaceful, beautiful place. A casino will destroy it. It will absolutely destroy it. You will have people coming out of there drunk, uh, you know, broken bottles, noise, that's not what Norfolk Island is about. And the gay and lesbian wedding thing, I, I just couldn't work that out. Where that came from, I don't know. So, you know, the, 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 this, there's, there is no business coming in there at the moment. And the way I saw it, Wayne, was um, that they only have tourism. That's all they have. Now, that stopped. They are desperately short of money, or indeed ran out. And they want the Australian government to help out. But they don't want to pay tax. So they kind of want, you know, and, and I'm, 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 I love the place and I love the people there. But you can't have something for nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah, I. But that's that's a double-edged sword because if you don't have any income coming in, how are you supposed to be able to pay tax? You you need something to ignite the economy so that they they can start luring. The the I don't uh, tongue work much. The ideal situation is for them to lure in the tourist trade that want to be in these peaceful, quiet places that are off the beaten path where you don't have tourist buses and all the other stuff. Yeah. But that's not, you know, that'll give you a steady stream of income, but it's not going to be a lot. Yeah, I don't, I don't think for one moment, you know, if people haven't got money to pay tax, then they then they haven't. End of story. It'd be like a, like a social, um, uh, you know, un un unemployed where you don't pay tax. But I think the case is, you know, obviously some businesses are there and some businesses probably make a lot of money. And I think they're the ones that don't want to pay the tax because they never have. And you can understand it where they're coming from. On the other hand, you can't expect, you know, one lot of people to give the other lot of people loads of money and get nothing at all in return. That's just mad. Doesn't happen. Yep. And now on that, that all falls under the umbrella of, like, social responsibility and all this stuff. So now I want to pick us up. We're going to time travel. So everybody, remember, we're bigger on the inside than, you know, on the outside. So we're, 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 going, to pick, we're going to pick up and jump back over to the land of uh, Greenwich, meany mean time. Yes. And I noticed something, uh, had an article in there about the political parties, and one of them is promising all sorts of things that would have impacts on social programs. 
And as I was reading through the article, something struck me because I had experienced pretty much the same thing here in the States while taking care of my mother the last few years of her life. I discovered that there was only one of the, the states in the United States that actually offered some financial assistance to those of us who were acting as stay-at-home caregivers. Because once you accept the role of caregiver, you immediately are cutting yourself off from the possibility of being able to hold down a, a job. Yes. You, you, you've yes. lost that. Even if you're working a menial, yes. doesn't pay much job, you're costing yourself you know, ten to twenty thousand dollars U.S. a year, uh, and you you have to give that up because you can't do it anymore. No, no. And you're getting nothing back in return. No, no, no check shows up in the mail except one state out in the Midwest, someplace where the people who were working as caregivers at home got paid one dollar an hour. Wow. Wow. But in the rest of the states, nothing. Forget it. You're done. I've, I've got I've got great admiration for anyone who gives up any everything to look after a parent. Okay, but there's long term effects to this. Of course. At at the same time, you are giving up the ability of earning money for those number of years. In my case, it was like five. Uh, you've lost, <laughs> let's say, a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah. You've actually lost more than that because the hundred thousand that you didn't earn, you also weren't contributing money into your own private social security and or whatever retirement yeah. accounts you might have. So you you not only cost yourself the money at the time you are doing this, you when you finally get around to retiring, are going to cost yourself a heck of a lot of money in your monthly pension payments. Because the way things work here in your later years, the more you contribute, greatly impacts how much you get when you do retire yourself. Yes. And it's not a pretty picture. <laughs> Believe me. I, I'm not sure how that works here. I think if you're unemployed, you get some sort of stamp or something on, on your pension so that it is paid, I think. But you have to tell them. We have we have a, a, a some kind of two types of pension. Here. We have the bog standard public pension, which the government pay after you reach a, a certain age. I think that's. I think it's sixty eight now. It's gone up, um, and we also have a private pension, uh, which my private pension will start paying out when I'm fifty five which is only in three years' time. Um, but the rules on that have changed recently as well. Now, uh, we used to have to save our private pensions over whatever number of years, and at the end of it, we would be forced to buy an annuity. Do you know what that is, an annuity? Yes. Right, so you, you hand over all your money to a company, not necessarily the one that you saved with. In fact, they tell you more often than not uh, uh, that you'll get a better deal taking the money elsewhere rather than staying with the people that you save the money with. Take the money out. And then you, you're forced to buy that for, and then it pays you whatever amount for many, many years until you die. Now, um, because a lot of the money is invested in stocks and shares and is affected by all these different money things going on, annuities have been pretty poor value recently. So those people that are coming up to retirement are looking around and they're not getting a good deal. So the government uh, have decided, I think it starts next week, that you are now able to take out all that money that you've been saving up on your pension date. Not as easy as it sounds, because I think, from what I've heard, you can take out 25% of it. Um, I'm not sure if that's a one-off or each year. You can take out 25%. That bit is yours. But if you go over that 25%, then everything you take out will be charged at tax rate 40%. That's how I understand it. So you've got to be a little bit clever. 
You know, you just take out that 25%. And what do you do with that? Well, as you know, I'm into property. So with mine, I would take that out and pay a chunk off the property, you know, off the mortgages. That would be my opinion. But what other people are saying is that some people not as sensible as me would see that money and say, oh, I'll go and buy a Lamborghini. I'll go and buy a Ferrari and blow the whole lot. Thus putting the pressure back on the state to pay their pension. You see what I mean? But you, you do get the two pensions. You get the one from the state and you would get your private pension as well. And that, that's kind of how it works here. Yeah, we have private pension schemes here too. You, uh, Many, many years ago, decades ago, they started a program with 401ks and all sorts of things with fancy names that were designed to confuse the crap out of you. My private pension was through the broadcasting union that I belonged to. Unfortunately, when Bernie Madoff raped and pillaged the financial community uh, of all those billions of dollars, the union that I belonged to was forced into bankruptcy. All of our pension funds conveniently disappeared from the planet as if they had never even oh, been yes. taken place. We Gone. had a guy. Boom. We had a, Sorry, we had a guy like that. Um, can't remember his name. He used to run the Daily Mirror. He ran off with everyone's pension. Yeah, I, yeah, I, the the people. There were two competing unions in the broadcasting business at at the time I started in broad scattering, and. Uh, one of them was the uh, the AFTRA uh, television and radio artists, uh, mainly based in California with the people who worked in movies and all that stuff. And then uh, here on the East Coast, we had the National Association of Broadcast Employees and Technicians, uh, which pretty much was an umbrella that covered you know anything in broadcasting. And uh, they, our union was just wiped out. You know it. it it no longer exists. Uh, the people at AFTRA made a token gesture of um, buying out or, or making an offer to those of us that belong to NABIT to join them. Uh, but if you accepted their invitation, you had to pay like a $5,000 initiation fee. Wow. <laughs> with, with, no of of any, no, <laughs> with no promise of any... With no promise of any benefits. No, no, no. All it did was give you permission to work in their area of, of business yes. provided you were invited because after is extremely tight and very protective of their employees and unless you are, are offered employment directly through them you forget it you're not going to see anything so right i think over here um it's certainly in the 70s uh, a lot of the jobs you would have to join the union to get the job and my dad was in uh, quite a strong union and he always says well you know when i was i was growing up and he says well no problem you know when you want a job son uh, you you can come straight in the newspapers no problem the union will get you straight in there um i'll sort that out but i did of course i didn't want to do that i didn't want to do the newspapers and i think um in a way i, I don't know how we do you know we seem to be chopping subjects here like anything which no, it's no problem um I, I think sometimes that's quite hurtful to the father, and I'm, so, I'm sure it happens a lot where someone's father, someone's dad, does a certain job and is expecting all along for his son to follow in his shoes. But I think actually, really, that does actually happen. And when father knows that actually he doesn't want to do the job you're doing, I think that must be quite hurtful, really. What did your father do, uh, Wayne? Uh, he spent 43 years from the time he returned home after World War II ended working in international business machines, IBM, Big Blue, or as we used to call it, international bald-headed men. <laughs> and uh, he started out tearing machines apart and rebuilding things, uh, recycling parts, uh, all sorts of things. And he ended up working in a very specialized area where they made these multi-layered circuit boards for their supercomputers right. and then he applied for a transfer to another job and they sent him out of the factory to go to remote rural locations where small factories were doing subcontracting work so he bought himself a nice we call them travel trailers you call them caravans yes and he would hook it up to the back of his big ford ltd and head off down into the hills of pennsylvania set it up in a campground he worked second shift which was like three to eleven 
Uh, so when he got home from work, he would putz around, do a few things, uh, go to sleep. And then when he woke up, uh, provided the weather was accommodating, he would grab his golf clubs and head out and go play a round of golf and then come back home and take a nap and then have something to eat and put on his work clothes and head off to work. And he loved it because he was there and my mother was here. And, uh, you know, it was uh, they, they only got together once in a while so my mother could go about her ridding from place to place and doing whatever it was she was doing with the ladies in her church group. And he was down there in the hills of Pennsylvania and enjoying, you know, a uh, nice uh, solitude and quiet because uh, my mother was a challenging person to be around and that's all I'm going to say uh, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to do the same as your dad? Uh, no way I, I knew from the time I was a young lad and I mean really young uh, I would pre- make uh, hand puppets and pretend I was uh, radio or TV newscaster. Oh, no, I, d- I did that why and I did that and uh, so I, I when, by the time I was eight or nine years old, my mother had arranged for me to meet some people in the broadcasting business in the big city to the east of us, and she used to drag me in there once in a while. And one of the companies up there had a clothing store that was run by some people who were uh, a hoot to be around. They were super funny, and they had this TV show that was put on live uh, once every week, and they did it on a Saturday afternoon. And I would go in there and work as an errand boy, just carrying notes from the control room and the TV station where the directors sat and all this stuff out to the cameramen on the floor, the people that were doing the show. And uh, that's how I got my start, weaseling my way into the broadcasting business. And a little while later, a man by the name of Sam Page, uh, who used to do a sort of a kind of a call-in show, uh, decided to teach me how to run his control room console so he didn't have to worry about doing that and he could just sit there and read newspaper stories or well, answer telephone calls and stuff like that. And <laughs> I, I, I was doing that when I was like 13 or 14 years old, which was probably illegal, but nobody gave a hoot. So, you know. like Yeah. Well, I used to have this big one. I remember my having this big box and I had puppets and I cut a hole out of the box and I put little curtains on there and I had these hand puppets and I used to do little shows for my mum and dad and that. That was that was my entry into show business. <laughs> I was doing the same thing, only yeah. I, I, I can I can one up you though, because we our first T V set when it passed away and was replaced, uh, they saved the cabinet, took out the picture tube. And so I could go around the back side of the and empty pretend cabinet. pretend you was on the and, telly. <laughs> Isn't that what I'm doing now, in effect? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Oh, did you get my message? I sent I sent you a Twitter message, by the way. A Twitter? Yeah. Um, my, my, I had my Tweety Bird connect with your Tweety Bird. I'm, I'm now following you. So if you hear heavy Twitter. breathing and Let stuff like that, look. don't you? Twitter. Hang on. I'm really not very good at this Twitter. I never have been. Uh, notific- oh there we are be careful of those collection only offers lure you into dangerous locations and steal your Yugo it's not a Yugo it's a Yaris <laughs> does that happen do you reckon uh, in this country yes that, really uh, here's what they're doing now and this is a true story the police departments in several areas around the United States now have things set up where if you want to do a, a deal that you found on Craigslist or whatever, and that once the people want to do an, an in cash uh, purchase, you know whatever. What is what is that Craigslist? You are, is that like is that like Gumtree or eBay? I, is I, it? I don't. Uh, Craigslist is like the wild wild west of eBay. Okay. Okay. Uh, and quite often on Craigslist, uh, people will you'll, you'll go to buy something from somebody. And the house you go to isn't even their house. It's a house that might have been up for sale, and they took the for sale sign down off the lawn and pried the front door open and just stand there waiting for you to show up. And when you show up, they stick a gun or a knife under your nose and say, give us your money. So now the deal is if you're going to do a cash Craigslist thing, they want you to do the transaction in the lobby of the police station. Gosh. So that way, if it's a legitimate deal, the people show up, you're not put in danger. <clears throat> but if it's a deal that might be shady, 
uh, as soon as the people that are trying to lure you in find out that you'll only do the transaction in the police station, they just pull up their pants and run away. That is scary, isn't it? That's really scary. Yep. Gosh. Oh, by the way, I did find a way to earn some money since all the broadcasting stations around here are pretty much run by computers now. Oh, uh, automation, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they, one person runs like six or seven we, radio stations. We've got they that just, here now. You know. We've got that here now. It's all falling apart. Yeah. Go on. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I made friends with a lot of you know pensioners and, and do things like mowing their lawns or shoveling their snow or yeah. uh, taking them to the grocery store or whatever. So, you know, yeah, that's... That, that's how I supplement my income. I, that's how I got the money to pay for the computer I'm using right now. As a matter of fact, I did the same thing with my uh, LED LCD TV. Yes. I, I got a 60-inch Gold Star that was a customer return for whatever reason. There was a, a little dent in the case. Right. And there is, a, there is a small about the width of your thumbnail scratch in the bottom right-hand corner that you can only see when the screen goes black. Right. Okay. You see this white scratch mark? Yeah. I paid three hundred dollars for it. Well, that's all right, isn't it? Uh, yeah, especially since it would have been nine hundred otherwise. Uh, how big is that one? Sixty inches. Sixty. Oh, yeah. That's. I. I think. Uh, mine is fifty, and I've had that about four years now. Uh, but it's not a smart TV. It's. Um... I. I didn't want the smart TV thing. I right. just. Uh, there were. There were things about the smart TVs that disturbed me. And since things have come around where they yes, discovered spying, that people yeah, could yeah. remotely turn on the cameras Camera, and do yeah. this, that, and one thing and another, yeah, no thank you. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I would like, um, I don't know if my room is too small for 75. I, I think, I mean, if, if it was a 75, that would probably be the biggest one I could have in the room. But I'm not sure when, when I'm going. I've got no plans to buy anything like that at the moment. I just want to knock the mortgages down a little bit, you know. Yeah, that makes good sense. And and, and I'm, I, <clears throat> I'm I'm getting a new video card for my computer so that I can go ahead and uh, plug it directly into the one of the HDMI inputs on the TV yes. set, so I can you know. Oh, I've got a 27-inch ASUS monitor here now that lets me you oh, know, they're see good things. Enough. So. Yeah, yeah, for, for watching this. Well, an absolute pleasure to talk to you today, Wayne. Wayne, what a lovely call and very interesting. Okay, well, my apologies to the audience. I'm sorry if we offended you. And <clears throat> to the tornado dodging Marge, <laughs> uh, we have the same problem here in upstate New York, believe it or not. I've, I've seen several tornadoes form almost directly over my head. Good God. Wow. And uh, a few years back, I saw one tornado go about two blocks away from me to the north. Meanwhile, I heard a noise, turned around and looked, and there was a second tornado only one block away from me to the south. Oh. And I was like, uh, oh, by the way, you, you said something about tornado damage being yeah. small in, in size. Tornadoes vary. You can get the small ones that only affect just a, a, a small radius. But yeah. we once had a one-mile-wide tornado come up the valley from the south out of Pennsylvania, and fortunately, it, it was not totally settled down on the ground, but mm. when it went over our area, there were places where it was sucking windows out of people's houses and pulling trees oh, straight up words. out of the ground. My words. So they can be massive, and uh, it's best th- if you I have th- some place where you can go underground because yeah, well, I you, you don't want just, to be above ground when that's I going I thought on. they were just very narrow. I, th- I didn't realize there was so, some, of them, some of them were really wide. Yes, they can be very wide and very, very... The very wide ones are well, tie, sometimes... Tie yourself down there, my friend. Tie yourself down. Okay, well, I'll say goodbye. I'm going to get out of here. i got to go let my cat out so he can go for his morning stroll and lay in the sun for a while. And uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I gotta, I... Cheerio, oh, Wayne. Right. Thank you very much, sir. I, I've, I've got a meeting with a, a lady tomorrow. I'm going to have a coffee and, and donuts. I almost forgot about that. Well, send a few over to me. I, I don't I got, mind a nice I have, to, I have to rush to the hair salon and get my hair yeah, done. So Yeah, get it cut off. Cheerio now. Goodbye. Bye, Wayne. There we are. There's our good friend Wayne. Uh, has an, he calls in a little bit more regularly now, which is uh, quite nice, I think. Um, Got to say hello to, uh, once again, Rory this morning. Good morning, Rory. Who says, I had a Parley pickle bike. I don't know what that is. What is a Parley pickle bike? And you start, you, 
used to use a hand bike at school. Oh, I know a hand bike. I don't know what a Parley Pickle bike is. That's a nice little name for a bike, isn't it? Um, he says, I love America. I've been to Florida on holiday in 1987, 2000 and 2002 with mum and dad. Um, oh, I love Florida. I love it. Five times I've been there. I think it's five anyway. And uh, Shania says, hi, a bit late, but watching you on my phone from the Morrison's car park. Good morning, Shania. <laughs> you got a little mention at the beginning of the show, my darling. So wait for the recording to come up later on, around about, around about five or six o'clock, and uh, you'll be able to uh, watch the uh, uh, recording there, OK? And I'm afraid you're a little bit too late to call in today, my darling. Sorry about that, my love. Very, very late. Why are you always so late? Anne appears right at the end of the show, usually. I don't know why that is. Very, very late, Anne. But I was going to just go read you this um, uh, uh, message that Anne sent in last week on the subject of uh, the bike that I've got that needs all these new bits and it's just not economically sound to, to replace you just buy a new one it's ridiculous the way nothing lasts anymore chris it's the consumer society nothing is meant to last and these industrialists make it that way so we have to keep buying more stuff back in the day yes bikes lasted forever and everyone could fix them themselves well we could it's true but that this the, even even the new one that needs the bits done right the brakes are okay but they're like I, I, I'm looking at these brakes that they've got on there. I don't know how to replace them. It was so easy when you just had these bits of rubber on either side. You just undid a screw, took it out, put a new one in, did the screw up, and it was done. Now it's got these, like, disc brakes. I don't know how they work. No idea. Um, maybe this means we all have to come together and set up a bike, car, and maybe washing machine clubs so we can all get our stuff fixed. <laughs> In a fair and cheaper way and go back to more caring times. Oh, we like caring times. I try and be caring, Anne. I try and be caring. Anne's had a hospital appointment this morning. Nothing to worry about. Just had a little mole that needs looking at. Oh, yeah. Well, it's all sorted. It's not growing, is it, darling? So you'll be okay. I tell you what, give us a ring on Wednesday. We've got another live show on Wednesday night, boys and girls. If you're around, Wednesday night at 11 p.m., that's 11 o'clock at night, UK time. Now, be careful with this because our clocks are just about to go forward. We are moving forward an hour as of tonight. So the show that you're watching at the moment, if you're in another country, assuming your clocks don't move, OK, this show will be an hour later next week, as indeed will the one if you've been watching us on Wednesdays, at 11 o'clock, it may well start an hour later. We still start at 11 o'clock here, but the time may change where you are. So just keep an eye on that. The best way to do that, perhaps, is uh, join me on my Facebook page. My Facebook username is Chris Reardon UK. Chris Reardon UK is my Facebook. So facebook.com forward slash Chris Reardon UK or Twitter. Uh, Twitter.com forward slash Chris Reardon UK or YouTube, YouTube.com forward slash Chris Reardon UK. Uh, there's an email address as well, boys and girls. My email is Chris at United Kingdom Talk dot co dot uk chris at united kingdom talk dot co dot uk i've got night off tonight so nothing for me happening tonight but tomorrow night i shall be hosting karaoke at the um cherry tree which is in east dulwich okay the cherry tree grove vale east dulwich we've got karaoke quiz night between 7 and 11 p.m perhaps you'll come down there if you've got a little while okay over in southeast london be nice to see you down there have a lovely saturday and i'll see you next week for the short shows all right main website for the program united kingdom talk.co.uk thanks for watching and listening bye-bye <laughs>